and welcome to another Wargame review from theplayersaid.com. My name's Alexander. And I'm Grant. And today, we're, it's this, this is kind of a preview, I suppose. Uh, we're looking at No Motherland Without. And this is a brand new game being put out by a brand new company called Lockhorn Games. And this is designed by a gentleman called Dan Bullock. Um, this is going to be hitting Kickstarter uh, relatively soon. Or if you're watching this, it's part of the Kickstarter campaign right now. Um, what it is, is this is a card-driven game. Um, I guess I said it was a war game review. This isn't necessarily a war game. Well, it's a war game just like, say, Twilight Struggle. Yeah. Because you're, you're, there's a struggle. This but is there's a, not open war. This is a Cold War game. Right, right. And basically it covers um, from 1953 all the way up until the present day. Um, so you've got, you've got the signing of kind of the armistice between the South and North Koreans... And that's kind of when the game starts. And uh, there's some very interesting mechanics, because this covers a long period of time. And how that kind of translates into the game is there's um, two different decks. You'll play with kind of the early deck for the first few rounds, and then the later deck for the last um, four or five rounds. And then there's also uh, different generations. There's a, there's a literal generation map, and the, there's individuals on there which we'll kind of get to later, and so the kind of the game progresses through a few stages, and that represents the the three different main rate. Well, it's all the big Kim regime, but the three different main leaders of that over the course of time. So what the game evolves in is one player plays as the as the North Koreans, and they're trying to build up their infrastructure, um, trying to gain prestige and kind of like world renown. And then you, the other player plays as the Western allies, which is kind of just vague Western term. And you're trying to get people, literal citizens, to defect and leave the country, uh, trying to incite political dissidents, and to also stymie the uh, the kind of the infrastructure, and in doing so, kind of say, oh, they, they lose prestige doing that. They don't have enough food, or not enough water, electricity, that kind of thing. So it, it's a very it's a head to head game, but you're not it's not combat. It's just mm -hmm. trying to mess each other's plans up, but also kind of progress through your own. Um, kind of your own things that you want to do as well. Mm -hmm. So, that's kind of an overview of what the game is, and we'll take a look at some of the details here in a bit. But uh, what's something that kind of struck out to you about this quite unique game? Well, I, I think I'll start my comments by, and you got to remember, we just played for the first time. We read the rules, reviewed the components. We, we would love to play this a lot more and become more familiar with it. We love card-driven games. I think it's one of our, our favorite games mediums. We we love war games. Card-driven games are very cool because there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of strategizing, a lot of a lot of damage mitigation. So this game is a CDG and and if I had five words to describe this, I would say this is an awesome CDG. Now, is it perfect at this point? We don't know that because we haven't played yeah. five times. The things that really stood out to me is, and we talked a lot about this as we were, were playing. In fact, we had a 15-minute convo between round six and seven trying to determine what the potential outcome could, could be. So really, like Alexander said, it's building up. The, uh, the Kim regime is trying to build up the infrastructure so that they can do missiles and kind of win the world over or make the world fear them. And the West is trying to aid in defectors getting out. And that's really how those two sides are going to score their points. Mainly improvements and the defectors. So you really have to focus on that. If you don't focus on that and you only try to focus on kind of retarding the development of your, your opposition, I don't know that you can win. You can prevent yeah. them from winning. But you but, but like you will have no point. I've spent so much time saying, you're going to get nothing from that. Right. Or you're going to get nothing from you get no point. So it, thing. So that was a very interesting thing. I don't know that we've played a lot of games that I felt were similar to that. I thought that was a very interesting struggle. Yeah. It's, it, it's all about influence, like Twilight Struggle, but I felt like that was something very prominent about this game, that I had to stick to my plan. I did a lot of defections. And then you you kept trying to come back here and not arrest my guys, but trying to build your stuff up. Yeah. And, and with I the like asymmetry that. in those things, yeah. you get some really cool play of like, well, I could build a bunch of stuff with my heavy cards, or I could remove like one road. 
Right. And you're like, that doesn't feel good to remove that one no. row. But I could Not, build a bunch of stuff, but I might, I might desperately yeah. need to, to to kind of stop things from happening. And, and the asymmetry is really good. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Both sides play very differently. Costs are different. For me to build a road, it's one action point. For you to remove a road, it's two. So it, you really have to think about whether you want to do that or not. Um, so yeah, really liked that struggle and that focus on, on the game and the cards themselves. I, I was also very worried about the rations table or track, which never really got down to the point I wanted it <laughs> because it then aided me in moving my pieces and defecting through China. Yeah. The hungrier they are, the more they want right, to they want to get out. Um, although it's interesting if they don't have as much food, could they move as far? Across the vastness of China. Well, they're, it's, it's, they're more willing to They're more willing to things. move, right, right. So very thematic. Uh, very interesting, the global opinion. Uh, what do you call this track? Yeah. Um, reserves were handled very differently in this game. Um, I felt like you had access to those much more readily than I did through some cards. I don't know that either I didn't focus on that well enough or... Well, I also had that... I had a legacy event, which is a special event that stays out the whole game, um, and and I played in the first turn. I yeah, think, and that because I had was to. like you can just throw a card away into the into the reserves. The reserves. I was like, I'll always do that and throw away these garbage blue events that I don't want to play. Yeah. So that was that's maybe why, but you know what's nice? A lot of games you can do kind of reserves, but they go away. The reserves don't go away in this. No, Are you, they so it's carry just, over from round. It's to round. called investment, and it is an investment. You yep. don't lose your investment until you spend it. And I like that. I thought yeah. that was good. Just one less thing to have to worry about. Yeah. The generation map was really cool. I, I just thought there were a lot of very uh, very unique and very interesting elements that were combined together to make a multifaceted struggle. Yeah. W one thing I enjoyed about the game is the rule book's 10 pages. Yeah. This was very easy to learn, the, the rules of the game. Um the, each player has different activities that they can do, but there's like five activities. I think I had four that I could do. And then not and they're a lot. Not, one of them has a long list of rules. The other ones are fairly simple. Build a thing, you know, move a piece, change a thing. You know, and then some of the bits are a bit more, okay, how, how, what's the sub-rules of all the defection mm -hmm. movements based on the location of them on the generation map, which we'll show you here in a bit. Um, but really... There's, it's not overly complex, no. so it was it's quick to learn, um, which that's nice, right? I want to be able to bash a game out. Sometimes you get a big kind of game like this, and the rule book, okay. Well, and you have to didn't feel that way with this. You have to kind of slog through it to to get comfortable with it. This I felt like after one round, we were very comfortable with yeah. the mechanics of and the game. Part, I guess that there's no head to head combat or anything, so no. there's not like oh, there's a bunch of modifiers based on a ton of stuff. The unit types, you just don't have. There's not open conflict, so that's nice and simple. Um, so what we'll do, um, let's take a look kind of at the map, and we'll go through some mechanics and bits and pieces of how everything works, and then we'll come back and wrap up with some final thoughts. So here's a look at the map, and this is kind of the final outcome of what we had. Um, as, as you can see, you've got this kind of map of North Korea, which is divided into regions over here, which are kind of color-coded with the names on them. And I'm not going to try and butcher all the names, we're just not going to go there. Um, up here we have what's called the generational map. And here there's, it's divided into three sections based on which kind of phase of the game you're in. This is kind of the first three rounds. And then you've got the last part of the game. And then the final round is played with this little section here. And the final round is kind of in flux. Typically it's round seven, but it could be earlier than that. But you'll, the game will tell you if that's the case. This is the defector map which we'll go over. Basically, the West is trying to build routes and get these defectors off the map to gain points. Um, there's a rations track. You've got some events and play marker, a global opinion marker. So this is going to switch to sides, and either side's going to get bonuses. There's a little prestige track over here. It starts low, and the DPRK want to get it high, and then the Western Allies want to get it low, up to below critical. Um, and then there's this enduring events track down here. This is really neat. Um, I don't know if I've seen this in a CDG before. Basically, these enduring events, they last for a certain amount of time, but that time is determined on how long they're on the track for. So the first one goes in the first space like this. Boop. So this event goes off. 
and it continues to be in effect until the next one is played and it gets moved down the track. So then these three are in effect and the same again and it pushes these down and then this stops being in effect and gets discarded. See this little discard bit right here on the edge of the board when the next enduring event gets played. So, well, obviously I don't have another one, but it would get played here in this spot, bumps these down, this one goes off the board and is finally gone. So what, that's really nice that you get this kind of flux of kind of extra rules or game states, and this is gonna be very different um, every game you play, because the cards are gonna come out at different times. So you might get different triggers and different combinations of kind of um, situations that you could put in. So this gives you, this is really neat. I've really, really enjoyed this little kind of aspect of the game down here. But uh, kind of more to the, the core rules of the game, the DPRK are attempting to place these wooden markers down. And there's three different types of markers. So you've got the red cylinder, and then you've got the white cylinder, and then you've got this red star. And these are three different levels of infrastructure. Red's level one, costs you one AP to put that down. Put it down right here. To do the second level, this is a little white, you put that down, that costs you two APs to do. And then to put the red star, costs you three APs to do. So really, the, the goal for the DPRK is to get as many of these out and to level three as possible. And you can see I had quite a lot, so that's very good. And this has some game effects, but each one of these wooden pieces is worth one point. So that's kind of a, a big deal at the end of the game. You want to have as many of these out as possible. So I think I ended up with like, I want to say 31 wooden pieces out. So I had 31 points, but you also get a point for each of these red tokens out and those guys are um, elites, so to speak, and very prestigious members of the uh, Communist Party, so to speak. So I had 33 points in the end, and that's the calculation. It's just all the wooden pieces plus the elites that you have. So that's kind of how I scored my points. Now, the Western player scores their points from these blue markers, and these blue markers are all people who successfully defected. So you kind of... It's a little bit more complex, but... They're trying to build these roots, which are these kind of red bars, and they spend APs to put this pawn down. So what they do is they choose, this person's gonna defect, and they start kind of in North Korea, and then you spend APs to move them along this track to get them out. And once they get out, they can either, there's, two, there's kind of two ways they can do that. This one's very risky. Um, then they, then this person would become a blue permanent defector. This is worth, each blue mark is worth three points. So that's great, they get three points from that. So they're just trying to get as many people out as possible through these routes. So they're building the routes, getting people through them, and then the North Koreans can remove these routes, forcing them to rebuild them, just kind of clog up and soak up some APs doing that throughout the game. And there's a lot of, or when they're in these red spaces, the DPRK has options to arrest them, ah, I arrest you, and then that's what these imprison markers are. Which is little, let's see, a little hand kind of coming through, some bars there. So you can see, I had a lot of people were, were imprisoned, kind of, kind of feel like a despotic leader, kind of putting people in prison. And this kind of got out of hand because there was an enduring event of, whenever I imprisoned someone, the Western player was able to imprison more people. And what that did is that clogged up the amount of people that could be elites, and it also altered kind of the positioning of, of this board. And why this that would be important is for this person, if they were to defect, it costs one AP to move each of these spots. If they were next to an elite, for example, if this guy was alive, and this guy was trying to defect, it costs one extra AP to move along that route. So the first move basically costs two, and then it would be three APs, but I've only moved one spot. And that's just because they're next to an elite on the board. So what you start getting is, is um, you know, if, if this person can be killed, in which case they get their black deceased marker on them, well, this person's not next to an elite anymore. So it's easier for them to escape because there's not those kind of big prestigious people kind of adjacent to them on that board stopping them from uh, kind of escaping um, North Korea. So this is a fascinating little kind of... This is, this is a fascinating minigame. This is kind of really the main game here for the Western Arts, is trying to get them in and out. 
this is what they're trying to focus on to gain all of these points. The green markers are kind of active political dissidents, people who are in North Korea actively, uh, proactively being against the regime. So there's a, and those are worth five points each. I was able to jail both of those, so no points there. But that was um, something that was very cool, very, very different. Not seen anything like that in a game before. Um, the cards themselves, we'll kind of take a look at those. So there's two decks of cards. Start with this black deck. These are kind of the early game cards. You play with these for the first three rounds. And these are very typical what you'd expect from a CDG. Let's see if we've got any gray ones here. Okay, so you've got these red aligned events for the DPRK. You've got an ops value, or you've got an event. Play one or the other. Same thing here. You've got a blue card, ops, or event. Now what you have are these enduring events, and these are the ones which are going to go on that enduring event track. Let's get these in focus here. So these are going to get placed down here. Or there's also, let's see if I can't find any. Uh, hey, so we've got these legacy events. These get played out in front of you and stay out in front of you the whole game, just give you a permanent ability. So I got this Cult of the Personality very early on. And let's get him in focus so we can see he's, it's actually a very, very powerful card. He says, once per turn, the DPRK may invest in, in reserves without triggering the event. So I was able to throw away these Western cards, basically, and, and just get reserves out of them, which was really, really powerful. I had this very, I think, turn one I had it. But outside of that, you're just trying to play your cards in the order where it will hurt you the least, and you can get the most out of it, just like you'd expect from any other CDG. And the opponent's trying to do exactly the same thing. After three rounds, you will use every single one of these cards. There's an exact number for um, three turns of eight cards each. Then you move on to the white stack. And these are just different. So these are, you know, this is very much kind of 1953 onwards. And then here you've got, this is Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un, their regimes, all of the events that happened under them. And, and honestly, some, some of them get so up-to-date, you're like, oh yeah, I remember seeing that in the news. And so you've even got, so you've got President Bush here, and I think even here, here it is, so you've got Kim, Kim Jong-nam, and this happened like just the other year. This is so recent, this, this game has a very kind of realistic feel to it. Like a, a very tangible, hey, this is happening now, which is nice to have a game kind of bring something to life in that way that we can kind of see what's going on. Um, as far as the game board goes, so the Koreans try to build these infrastructure points, and what the Western allies are doing are, are placing these outage markers, and it's basically just a power outage. Wherever these are, they place them in these little regions. Um, the North Koreans can no longer build in this. So they're trying to throw as many of those out as possible. Oh, there's no electricity here, you can't build here. So that's kind of one of their things trying to defect, 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 but also throw as many of these out as possible so I can't build my infrastructure. In the same way that I'm trying to build my infrastructure and kind of remove your roads and arrest your defectors so you can't do that. And the game has fantastic kind of tension between those things. I want to do what I want to do, but I want to stop you doing what you want to do. And it goes vice versa that way. But that's kind of, that's a lot of what the game is. It's very, very simple rules-wise in, in that sense. The, the most complex part of it, and complex is kind of a stretch, um, is this ballistic missile research here on the side. And basically what happens is the North Koreans are trying to put research into these ballistic missiles so they can launch missiles, which obviously I'm not going to be able to find one right now. Here we go. So they, they can test these missiles and in doing so gain prestige. This is the way that they can win the game outright is if they launch a missile, whilst their prestige is high, they instantly win. To do that is very difficult, but basically you have to have um, a ballistic missile research level of 6 for this card. This is kind of one of the big cards. And what that means is, I can, for, for an action, I can take one of my cards, or a grey card, and I can tuck it into one of these 6 spots. And these spots they're going to kind of designate my, my ballistic missile research level. And this is 
contingent on how many of these red stars I have out. There's level three improvements. So I've got more than six, so I put my card under the six spot. That's great news. If I wanted to use this, I believe I've got to have six power of cards under the six spot. Currently I've only got three, because that's what I put under there. So on a subsequent turn, I'm going to have to put a two under there, and on a subsequent turn, I'm going to put another one under there, and then I can play this. I shoot my missiles off. Currently, I'm at prestige level low. So I don't instantly win the game. I just go up to medium, and then global opinion goes away from me because they're like, stop shooting missiles at people. If I was at high and I played this, you just win the game because you have great prestige in the country, you unify everyone under the banner of DPRK, and you know, the Western allies are like, okay, maybe we'll come to a negotiating table with you, and kind of that's just how, that's how they win the game. Now, that's, again, very difficult to do. Um, as far as the Western allies go, they can outright win the game if the prestige level ever falls below critical. And that happens by not meeting these criteria on the turn track. And these criteria are, at the end of turn one, the DPRK has to have nine points worth of infrastructure or, well, also, and elites. So that's these two little red markers here. And early on, you just have to have nine, because the board starts with nothing on it. So you've got to put out nine wooden pieces or a combination of wooden pieces and elites, right? At the end of turn two, you have to have a total of 15. And then turn three, you've got to have 21. And then turn four, you have 24. And then it kind of starts to peter off and, and go down a little bit as the country's hit by famine and kind of reduce those conditions go down. So this is something that's very, very interesting and it's very um, difficult to win an outright victory. Most of the time you're going to end up, um, I think, doing this by victory points. So that's kind of a look at everything in No Motherland Without. We'll kind of wrap up with some final thoughts here. So that was a look at all the different kind of moving pieces, so to speak. Um, so final thoughts for me is I had an enjoyable time playing this game, uh, entirely unique in its theme. And that's something that I really enjoyed. Never played a game on North Korea. No. Ever. That wasn't, especially, there's Korean war games out there. Right. This is not that. No. Uh, this, is, this is a great kind of, it's a political, diplomatic struggle, which I, I, I love that. I love those kind of games, especially when they are as rules simple as this. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of complex, deep strategy in how you play your cards and when. Yes. But the rules are easy to learn, so you can get into that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, entirely unique mechanics. Never seen anything like these in, in this style of game, so that's really cool. And to me, this whole system and the idea of this game has a ton of potential. Mm -hmm. You could... You could rework this into a lot of different I, I situations. Iraq, Iraq and Iran, Iranian. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a ton of options yeah. for kind of lesser covered, lesser game topic topics to be to be gamed. That would be yeah. awesome. I would really like to play this system with a couple of those. Yeah, other I'd love elements. to see where they take this and what they yeah. do with it. I felt like the cards were. Um, you know, good. They had a little bit of text on them, so yeah. I learned some bits and pieces. And it was also fascinating. Some of the cards, like it was, uh, gosh, is it, is it, it's Kim Jong Un's nephew who got assassinated like mm -hmm. two years ago. That's one of the cards of the game. Yeah, it this is. This is yeah. a very modern game towards the end, and, and that was like, oh, okay, I remember seeing that on the news. So yeah. that was cool in a way to like see some real life stuff that I have like some actual connection to in the game. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of games that do that for me. It, it feels similar to me like when we play Labyrinth. Yeah. You know, Labyrinth yeah. is a game that deals with the war on terror and has focused on the last, what, 15 years and or so. And especially the expansion to that, where it's yeah. 2010 onwards, where I'm like, yeah, I watched that on Yeah, TV. five years ago. Yeah, we were watching, yeah. That, so that's neat. I always enjoy that in a game where it's something that's very relevant to me. I'm like, oh, right. we're living this Contemporary. Now. Like, this is happening yeah. now. And when you start doing the ballistic missile tests, you're like, Okay, yeah. That, yeah uh, they just did that a week ago. Yeah. So very, very cool in that mm -hmm. way of like, this is a, I don't know, it, it's not some ancient game where it's like, sure. Right. But I know sure nothing. How, I'm sure this yeah. is how it was. Right. Like, this is like, this is happening now. And yeah, more contemporary. Why... And I think that's some of the allure to it because we, we understand the events. Um, I, 
We love CDGs because there are different types of CDGs. Some CDGs, the events don't trigger when you play your opposition's color card. This one is that. So this becomes a damage mitigation yeah. in many ways exercise. How do I play these cards to, oh, that one won't go off because Alexander doesn't have an improvement here. So I'm going to play that one now because you know what? Next turn he may. So that was a great element of this, this design and I think added to its depth uh, in the CDG realm. Yeah. But and understand that, at least for me, when it is that style, that lengthens the game. Oh, it makes it much because longer. Because you can't just yeah. be like, oh, just toss this away, toss that away. Yeah. Like, you can you do have that. To... In the 1960 making of the president, cards are just like, whatever, it's a number. That's all yeah. that is. Don't yeah. the colors, frankly, Didn't immaterial. Matter. Whereas in this, it's like... <sighs> well, you have to read through and prioritize and yeah. strategize. And and that changes every time another card is yeah. played. So you get a bit of extra length out of that. Uh, but the game wasn't didn't overstay its welcome, I didn't feel. No. Seven turns. and that was We played seven turns. Could have been five. That's the longest it can go. It can be as short as five because of those um, unique kind of in-game mechanics that we showed you. Right. But uh, that's something that's that's cool. I, I like you said. I like a game where it's like you got to think through your hand, yeah, and that just gives that extra level of strategy. To but game. it's always funny when you when you drew the hand of cards. I think there were eight cards each round. You know, there was about forty five to sixty seconds worth of silence. Yeah, because yeah. we're sitting here reading, trying to digest and understand, and then trying to strategize. I always try to line my cards up kind of in play order. Because I'm one of those, uh, what's that called, pneumatic, where if I don't see it, I kind of tend to forget about it. And I get distracted by, ooh, look at this shiny thing. But I wanted to do that later. Now, in a card where you're going to draw randomly, I will, I'll mix those up. It's just a, it's a pneumatic thing that I do to, to assist me. But yeah, the, the asymmetry also, to me, was very, very, uh, very different. Um, in fact, there are events called legacy events yeah. that kind of play out in front of you like a capability yeah, from like the coin game and, and you get a, a permanent ability alexander my guess is you ended up with what eight of those seven or eight at the in front of you at one time some of went away got this but i got like five very early right and, and i think i had two <laughs> out at once and there was about two others away. <laughs> yeah so it was that was very different um i felt like you got a lot of additional powers yes. from time to time and that happened because I wasn't able to get rid of those cards. Yeah. On the flip side of that, you had two cards that allowed you to circumvent the event by, what, discarding one to get ops? Yeah, yeah. with that, with that ba aid from Beijing and Kremlin, the rules right. say you just discard a card without triggering its event. So, sweet, you just yeah. get rid of it. So that was, uh, that was very interesting. I felt like it had a, a lot more freedom, especially early in the game. One of the, the aid from the Kremlin goes away because the U.S. After is half, round three. halfway through the game. Um, but I, that gave me a lot of freedom early to kind of do whatever I wanted to. I felt like my hands were not terrible mm -hmm. because I could just ditch the bad ones and, well, and, and what I wanted to do. Something that I did that I really couldn't avoid, I kept playing cards that allowed you to flip that Beijing card back to active. It's kind of like the China card from Twilight Struggle. Yeah. There are a couple of events where... You know the U.S. takes it away from the from the Russians, and they're able to use it immediately. I think you probably got to use that twice in a round, at least twice that I could remember. At least, yeah, I remember maybe going three. Once. So yeah, exactly. that was something that once again I couldn't get around that. But that's an asymmetrical element that you've really got to worry about and think about and think about how you can kind of minimize that damage. And I like that. And one, and the, I guess finally to wrap up, kind of as. As much as I felt like I was like killing this game, I thought I was on top of it, and I felt like I could do a lot of what I wanted, and I especially had my infrastructure like tip top. Yeah, we'll show you the map. It looks pretty good. His map, his map looks we'll, pretty good. <laughs> we already showed them the map. Oh the yeah, editing. good point. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it was a three point game in the end. Yeah, I had thirty three points and he had thirty, yeah. and I thought I was running away with it. Yeah, and I was like really close to hoping to end the game with my ballistic missile test, which couldn't do it in the end. Yeah, which is actually I'm like okay, that's very difficult to do. Yeah, that seemed much harder to do than I thought it would be. It's, and and uh, yes, for you winning with your auto victory as well, very hard was difficult for you because of how well I did. And I, I don't, I don't, you, yeah. If you jumped on early, 
I could see the game ending very quickly. Because it would yeah. just take two turns of not meeting these and it's over. Yeah, but that boy. Yeah, and maybe I should have been more at the beginning. Tried to put out these, uh, what did we call these? I'm sorry. Those are the outage markers. Outage markers. Maybe I should have been more aggressive my first turn or two. I think I focused on... But that's also difficult to do. And that's, yeah. But that's the game, right? That is the game. It is difficult right. to do everything, you can't do everything that everything. you want to do. And I think that was, yeah. having spoken with Dan Bullock, that's what he wanted. He wanted yeah. the game to be incredibly tense. And, for and, and full of choices. Yes. You have to decide. But I would like to play it again and, and really try to focus just those first two rounds, trying to get you, because, man, if you could just drop two levels, if, yeah, if you don't make over. that first round, it goes to critical. Yeah. I'm like one point away from losing, basically. And I don't know that there were more than one or two cards that increased that Yeah, maybe. maybe, uh, maybe I think I saw two. Yeah. And, so, but then there were ones that made it go down again. Right. Yeah, so... It's interesting. It it uh, at a second play, it may turn out differently. But yeah, really neat elements. I also like the components really well. The yeah. the improvements are really cool. That that looks like a nice improvement, and I I kind of like that. The star on top is a nice touch. And again, this is a prototype copy, so everything is kind of not final. But but it's close. But if it was final, I'd be happy with the components. Yeah, which it's is, a great looking map. That's always good. Sometimes you know you play a prototype game and like okay, this Wait, is what, yeah, yeah, it's we're, not going to be we're pushing yeah. like print and play stuff around. I mean, when it's when the polished product for the prototype is like this, that gives me great hope for uh, for, for the Kickstarter that's going to end up as a great game on your table. Yeah. So I appreciate you watching and sticking with us. This has been No Motherland Without. You'll be able to get this on Kickstarter to come in here real soon. Um, this is from Dan Bullock, who's heading up a new company called Lockhorn Games. Nice job, Dan. I think you did a good job on this game. Yes. And thank you for watching. Um, I've been Alexander. And I'm Grant. And we're from theplayers8.com.